Once upon a time, 30-pin SIM modules were state-of-the-art, with 1 MB capacity each. Windows 3.1 required at least 1 MB of system memory to function, a requirement you could barely meet with 4 256KB memory sticks. However, with 8 1 MB modules, your DOS and Windows setup had an abundance of memory. It was rare to see a motherboard like this 386 board from Soyo equipped with a maximum amount of supported memory. And the reason was simple. Memory was expensive to produce, and the density of memory chips was low when those SIM modules were widely used. If I'm not mistaken, 1 MB modules were the most common during the height of 30-pin SIM module popularity. When Intel released the 486 in 1989, 30-pin SIMs were about to be phased out in favor of 72-pin SIMs. Not only did the new model support a 32-bit data bus, but they also allowed for higher capacities due to the increased number of chips per module, and further technological advances to increase the memory density. Over time, fast page mode or FPM memory made room for extended data out, or EDO memory. EDO was faster, offered more capacity per chip and was also cheaper to make due to manufacturing improvements. Unfortunately, EDO memory chips were incompatible with older systems, including my 386. Rarely have I seen 4MB fast page mode SIM modules. But if you follow my channel for a while, you may remember when this single 32MB EDO module triggered the start of a journey to dig deeper into how this ancient memory works. Here is a short recap. One of the 16 memory chips on this module was faulty. I tried to find out which chip it was by using software. But I only got clarity after I desoldered the chips and applied the process of elimination. And then I had 15 good memory chips with a capacity of 2MB each, and no use for them. I stumbled upon a project by Uplate Geek who provided Gerber files and schematics for 30-pin SIM modules. So I decided to let PCBWay make one batch of those PCBs for me. PCBWay is also the sponsor of today's video. Without them, I wouldn't be able to share all of this with you. So thank you PCBWay for being such a great partner. After soldering the memory chips to the PCBs, I tried them in my 386 system. However, as mentioned before, EDO memory will not work in systems requiring FPM memory. That was the moment I finally believed that EDO memory doesn't work in FPM systems. Sometimes I have to see it with my own eyes before I believe something. But then… Plot twist! One of you posted details of a hack under my video explaining how to turn EDO memory into FPM memory. All I had to do was to disconnect one of the pins of each memory chip and bridge it with a neighboring pin. I explain the details in my other videos, so feel free to watch them if you haven't already done so. After reading that comment, I had to immediately try it. I couldn't believe it. Those EDO memory chips worked in my 386 system after applying the hack. I had a suspicion back then that there is a way to make it work, but I wasn't able to point a finger at it. You can see here that when I boot a Socket 7 platform with one EDO and one FPM module, the configuration summary reports that none of the memory banks is populated with EDO memory. Speedsys specifically mentions that it detected FPM memory. The memory controller accesses both modules in fast page mode which seems to be supported by the EDO module. Now, all I wanted to do was to have an option to easily switch between EDO and FPM memory. Although the extended data out capability of those modules is questionable and probably not a very common use case. After a couple of days and using Uplate Geek's Gerber files as reference, I ended up with a modified set of PCB schematics and Gerber files. And very soon after, I held the PCBs manufactured by PCBWay in my hands. These PCBs have been ordered over 100 times and downloaded nearly as often. I'm really happy that so many people found value in them. Those modules also enabled me to explore RAM drives on this 386 system, install Windows 3.1 in memory and run it from there. However, there was always something that bugged me. A SIM module has 12 address lines and 8 data lines, essentially an 8-bit module. By utilizing the CAS and RAS signals, we can double the number of address lines from 12 to 24. 
I also covered this topic extensively in another video, if you want to know more about it. With 24 address lines, we can address 16,777,216 memory locations. Since we have an 8-bit module, we can say we have access to 16,777,216 bytes. Or 16,384 kilobytes. Or 16 megabytes. I only created 4 megabyte modules in my previous videos. So there should be room to address more memory. Before I blindly ordered memory chips, I wanted to find out if it was possible to equip my 386 board with 16 MB SIM modules. It is time to gather some information. The page about this board on the RetroWeb shows 32 MB as the maximum supported memory size. Eh. And it doesn't get better when we browse through the manual of my board. The table under memory configuration lists 4 MB modules, but no mention of 16 MB modules. That is not a good start. There is one more place we can look for information. The documentation of the chipset on my board. My 386 board has an 82C495 SLC chipset from Opti, which also houses the memory controller. Luckily, the RetroWeb has some information about this chipset, including a brochure. The suffix SLC is probably an acronym for super low cost. <sighs> It just keeps getting better. Hey, but wait! The brochure mentions support of 64 MB of high speed page mode DRAM memory. And the same information repeats in the table under <laughs> Vital Statistics and in the picture below. So it seems the chipset does support 64 MB of memory, but that would imply that we only use 4 memory modules? But there are 8 memory sockets on this board. Huh. I still have questions. After a few minutes of browsing the web, I found the technical documentation of the XLC version of this chipset. In there, I found a table that specifies 64 MB is possible when 16 MB modules are installed in memory bank 0. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be possible to populate both memory banks with 16 MB sticks. But that would still be double the memory we have achieved with 8 of the 4 MB modules. So why are we limited to bank 0 only? I was curious. And I think I found the answer by looking at the pinout diagram of the chipset and comparing it with the CPU address mapping. We already confirmed that we need 12 address lines to access all the memory locations on our chip. And by using CAS and RAS signals, we can reuse the same address lines to achieve a 24-bit address. As shown in this table, the address line MA11, the 12th address line, is required only when we use 16 MB memory modules. Unfortunately, MA11 is a shared pin on the chipset, with a signal RAS1. The RAS signal of memory bank 1. So if we need this pin to address the memory installed in bank 0, we can no longer address any memory in bank 1 due to the missing RAS signal. And that is why we are limited to bank 0 and a total of 4 times 16 MB SIM modules. Ugh, I wish I could have gotten this board to post with 128 MB of memory. But first things first, we don't even have 16 MB SIMs yet. Of course, I could buy a set from somewhere, but who knows if they would work. And they cost quite a bit of money. Since I already have some experience designing SIM modules, I thought it would be nice to build my own. But to do that, I need to get compatible memory chips. I bet you know what's coming. Scrapyard to the rescue. Most of my projects these days would not come up if I hadn't been able to find oddities like this memory module at this magical place. 168-pin SDRAM lookalike. But with EDO memory chips. Surprisingly, on this module are 16 megabits times 4-bit EDO memory chips. Exactly what I need to make 16 megabyte SIM modules. Every single chip on this module has a capacity of 8 MB. But there is another issue. Those memory chips require 3.3 volts. So simply putting those modules on a PCB is not enough. We need to consider the lower voltage requirements too. Okay, do we have everything to make those modules now? Almost. I still need to design the PCBs. So let's put some pads for the memory chips here and here. Here go some cheap linear voltage regulators and some capacitors. And we're done. I wish it would be that simple. 
It took me a day to design this PCB. And in case you're wondering, the two voltage regulators are there to make the module look symmetrical. You could probably get by with just one. But now we are ready to ask PCBWay to make some PCBs for us. I already ordered PCBs in many different colors. Yellow, red, blue, green and white. So the only standard color that I haven't tried is black. Quite suitable for high-end memory modules, don't you think? Ordering from PCBWay is super easy. Upload the Gerber files and enter the specifications for your project and PCBWay will take care of the rest. For those memory modules, make sure to order them at a thickness of 1.2mm. Of course, if you'd like to get those PCBs for yourself, you can head over to PCBWay's shared project space and order them directly from there. And after a few days, a small box arrived at my door. Let's see how those PCBs look. Wow, what a fantastic look. The contrast between the black color and the white silk screen looks phenomenal. I think I like this combination the most. All we need to do now is to get the memory chips of this module and get them on the new PCBs I got from PCBWay, add a few more components and hope they will work on my 386. The Aten ST862D hot air station will be perfect for removing those chips. If you're interested in this hot air station, check out the link in the video description. If the link doesn't work, look for the model on the screen. And now it's time for some soldering.
And four modules are finished. I have to say it once more, those modules look amazing. But now let's get them installed on the board and test them. What's the use of them looking pretty if they are useless and don't work? Oh, here's an issue. The legs of the switch are too long and touch the next module. Okay, that is much better. Now there is enough space between the modules. We also need to make sure all switches are set to FPM. I can't believe it! 64 megabytes of memory on my Soyuz 386 board! Even though this system will have trouble utilizing most of it, it is still fascinating to max out the memory. And how do I know it can support more? Well, I tried to populate bank 1, but was unable to make the board post. With 64 megabytes, however, everything seems to be working well. I can increase the size of the RAM drive we created in another video and boot into Windows 3.1. I also tested the memory using Memtest 86 Plus. It took 10 hours to finish one complete pass. So forgive me if I haven't gone through multiple passes. While Memtest 86 Plus hammered the memory, I pointed a thermal camera at the memory modules. But there was nothing out of the ordinary to report. The memory chip stayed below 40 degrees. And for another test, I took out my oscilloscope to see what voltages we get on the power, address and the data pins of the memory. The supply voltage is at 3.2 volts. Perfect. Our linear voltage regulators seem to work well. On the address and data pins, the voltage remains in the safe zone of 3.4 volts. I am really happy that this project turned out so well and I cannot wait to use those modules on 486 systems. As I said before, the PCBs are available on PCBWay's shared project space. If you are fortunate and have access to the correct memory chips, you can build your own 16MB SIM modules. But if you don't, then I may have a solution for you. As you can see, the scrapyard rewarded me with plenty of double-sided memory modules and compatible memory chips. I don't want to salvage the chips from all modules, since they seem to be unusual and may be helpful in other projects. But we can sacrifice a few to build high-capacity 30-pin FPM SIM modules. If you're interested in a set, check the comment section below this video. There is a pinned comment where you can declare your interest. I want to get an idea of the demand for such memory modules. It would be best if you hit the thumbs up on that pinned comment. And while you're at it, maybe like this video too. Depending on the number of likes this comment gets, I could order PCBs from PCBWay and assemble a few kits. Could this be the end of Scare's high density 30 pin FPM memory? And with this, we have reached the end of today's video. Thanks to PCBWay for a great partnership that makes all this possible. I can't wait to see some of my 486 boards boot up with 128MB of system memory. And I'm curious if you remember the highest amount of RAM you had in your 386 and 486 systems. Were you happy with it? Or would you have liked to have access to more? As always, I'm looking forward to reading all your comments. Finally, I want to thank all my Patreons for their invaluable support. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.